Well, hello, and welcome to another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. Um, some time ago, uh, many videos ago, uh, if you look back through the back catalogue, which we're now developing after three and a half years, um, you will see that I did a video on one of the most iconic Porsche 911 models, and that's the 2.7 RS from 1973-ish. And for good reason. Uh, they're now um, sort of venerated as one of the best to drive, the most raw, uh, the first car where less was more, etc., in the Porsche range, um, certainly commercially. And they hit on to something uh, incredibly special, which was that they could charge more for less. Um, nice work if you can get it, but that's, that's what happened. And uh, they wondered how many they'd be able to sell and um, people bought them in droves. They had to end up, instead of making 500, they made a Sanction 2 and a Sanction 3, which went up to 1,500 and odd cars. Um, but we're not here, I'm not particularly talking about that car today. Um, I'm talking about the overlooked Porsche 911. The, uh, um, it sounds awful to say it, the poverty spec runt of the litter, really. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, and that is this car here, which is a beautiful car. It's the Porsche 911 2.7 Lux. It's the, um, the, the base model 911 from 1976 in this car's case. And um, it, we've got this in. It's just a lovely example of um, the 911. And it's finished in this rather um, fetching gold metallic. Uh, if you're a fan, it's great. If you're not, you, obviously, there are plenty of other cars out there. Grand Prix, well, are there? That's the point. Uh, there's Grand Prix white, Guards red, a whole gamut of colors that they did them in, of course. But this car, I believe to be quite rare because it is an original, um, very much in the original vision of the 911, 1975 car that isn't a Carrera this, it isn't a, uh, a, um, a, a turbo prototype, uh, it's, it's none of those things. And um, it's, got, it's got these sort of, people tend to take these wheels off and change them for the, the Fuchs alloys, the, um, the, the five spoke alloys. And these, these were called in periods, certainly in the UK, cheese cutter alloys. Um, but these are um, still on the car as it came new. And um, it's, it, it's just, uh, it, it's a sort of a lightweight car by com the comparative standards of the day. It was one of the first cars, first model years to have the impact bumpers. I think they came out in 73, 74. I'm sure 911 aficionados, aficionados easy for me to say, will, um, will correct me in, in a heartbeat with all these facts and figures. But um, it's uh, got the 2.7 litre engine uh, with the Bosch, K Jetronic injection, the later uh, generic injection system, which actually even was used on the turbos. Um, by this time, um, emissions laws were getting more stringent, particularly in California, particularly in the US. And the old MFI, mechanical fuel injection, such as was fitted to the 2.7 RS, um, was becoming too dirty. It was just developed too many exhaust emissions because it wasn't accurate enough. Um, if, to make them run absolutely perfectly, they needed to be slightly on the rich side. I um, mean, a couple of people have asked about emissions facts and figures. So on an MFI 911, you'd be talking a CO at idle of about three and a half, four percent. On something like this, the CO level at idle is about one and a half to two percent. So it's a big difference in exhaust emissions. Yeah, they, they started fitting this injection system right across the range. Every model of 911 had um, had this ignition system, uh, injection system, the carburetors had gone, uh, the three choke carburetors, um, and um, uh, as I say, even the turbo had the KG Tronic injection system on. And why not? It works exceptionally well. It's a very good, reliable, simple system. Um, there are one or two things I'm going to sort of talk about on the 911, which people um, who are potentially buying one need to take note of and maybe people are driving around with unwitting faults on their cars and um, first one of them that has been got my goat for many a year is the the, the windscreen wiper layout um, this is correct uh, it's a mirror image of the one on the left hand drive cars um, and the way these should be and lots of people get these the wrong way around is this is cranked this wiper arm is cranked, it's got a bend in it to sit on the bottom of the windscreen nice and neatly as per Porsche directives. 
and this wiper is straight so it sits on the bottom of the curve of the windscreen here and what I've, I've seen so many 911s where people have put that wiper on that and that one on that and they just do not look right so if you have a 911 and, and just can't resist um, using finding a purpose to use the 13 millimeter spanner in your workshop drawer that's as good a reason as any just undo the 13 millimeter nut which is concealed under there and I won't pull it off because it's quite stiff um, undo it wiggle it just gently tease it off swap them over and there you are you have a factory specification Porsche 911 win windscreen wiper mechanism um, I'm going to look at some of the controls inside um, because this car is ergonomically challenging um, it, nothing is intuitive uh, it is once you've, got, you've driven them for many years. I mean, I first did, started working on one of these in 1984, but um, they, uh, they do have their quirks, to put it mildly, and uh, switches are in the most unlikely of places, matron. Um, so uh, we'll, um, we'll just delve into this. I mean, this, this particular car, what makes it so special for me is the fact that it's in lovely condition and it's, it's sort of as faithful to the original vision as a 1976 911 or 975 can be. OK, it's got the impact bumpers on it, but in other respects, it's very simplistic. No power steering, which any of them had at this time. None of them had. It's got this um, excellent uh, sunroof with its beautiful alloy wind deflector, which I think was made by Wabasto, who did a lot of subcontract work for um, uh, car manufacturers with things like hoods and sunroofs and things. And um, yeah, electric windows, electric windows, really in 1975. Um, but this is, this is lovely. This is the original, original handbook pack. Um, and it's quite surprising really, because uh, we have either the 911 or Carrera 3.0. This is the 2.7. In the RS with the, uh, with the dirty fuel injection system, the, uh, the MFI, the, the Bosch, uh, mechanical injection that developed 200 brake horsepower. Uh, in this car, it develops 165. Uh, so it, but you know what? On the road, it it still feels quick and lively. This car. Um, so we'll have a look at the switch gear, and I'm also going to have a look at a couple of things in the engine compartment, and then we'll take it for a run. Well, um, <laughs> we have uh, an interesting switch layout, as I mentioned, which is what pretty well how all 911s were at this time. Storks in the usual place doing usual things. Um, one thing that is really amusing is you've got the wiper stalk here, um, and then you've got another switch here which controls the intermittent wipe. So you turn that on, and then you alter the amount of interval between the wiping strokes. And one is at the one end of the dashboard and the other is on the steering column. Go figure. Um, the other interesting one is this, which, oops, he says, having switched the wipers on, um, is the electric sunroof switch, which is just here. Um, try finding that if you don't know the car on a rainy, uh, a rainy winter's evening. The, the sunroof is very good. I mean, it closes extremely quickly. I wouldn't like to get my... Uh, um, bank vault door springs to mind. Wouldn't like to get my fingers jammed in that. Thank you very much. Um, and the uh, the gear change is the usual sort of approximate but uh, vaguely in the right place 911 gear change of this era. Um, and the steering wheel on this is non-standard. Uh, it's slightly smaller than the original wheel, um, and it does actually sort of block out the instruments a bit. But this this interior is otherwise lovely. I mean, it's roomy, it's comfortable, it's immaculate. Um, and it's unpretentious. It, it's not trying to be uh, a super amazing um, cutting edge, this, that or the other. It is just a lovely basic 911. Um, it delivers all the experience um, that you'd want from a 911. And um, yeah, I think uh, it's just a very happy place to be. I'm going to talk about a couple of things in the engine compartment and, um, and then we'll give it a run. Well, one of the things that um, buy buyers should be aware of with 911s, and this is a big deal, um, is the what are called the pressure-fed timing chain tensioners. So there are, there are two timing chains in the engine, duplex chains, 
and they have a, uh, a tensioner which for many years, right from launch through to uh, 1984 when the Carrera 3.2 came out, they had a timing chain tensioner which was basically a piston inside a cylinder with a roller on the end for the chain to uh, go on. It's a completely autonomous assembly that bolted on to the, uh, the timing uh, housing. Um, and it relied on a, a quantity of oil inside to basically apply pressure to it. And it, it was not connected in any other way to any part of the engine. Um, and what happened was, or what could happen and, and did happen, was that the, uh, the, if the oil, if there was a leak between the piston and the cylinder and the timing chain tensioner collapsed, basically, um, the chain would start to rub on the aluminium timing casing and wear away uh, the aluminium and the engine would start to sort of basically run on a diet of aluminium filings, which is never good. Um, and I had exactly this happen to a customer of mine. He had a 79 911SC and he got in his car one morning to drive to London from the northwest, a couple of hundred miles. And by the time he got to London, his engine was rattling and knocking its head off and it had no oil pressure. And it was because one of these timing chain tensioners chain uh, failed. So what Porsche did with the introduction of the Carrera 3.2 in 1984, I think, uh, was actually connect the, the timing chain tensioner to the engine oil pressure circuit. So that when the engine was running, even if it did have a catastrophic failure of the seal inside, the oil pressure would still keep the thing working and it wouldn't sort of uh, go into full, fully retracted self-destruct mode. So a lot of people um, retrofit these now. So if you're looking to buy a, uh, a 911, I would suggest if, if it, it, you really want to see if that's been done or not, and if it hasn't, it needs to be done as a matter of urgency because it is the number one most important modification on these cars. Um, if it's good enough for Porsche, I mean, admittedly, it took them nearly 20 years to come round to the idea, but it's worth every penny of having it done. And you can tell it's been done by these lovely little oil pressure pipes coming from the, uh, the oil pressure gauge uh, sender unit there. Um, this car has the Cagetronic injection, as I say. Uh, the fuel distributor is up here. You've got the mixture screw um, adjustable up there with a special little hex key, special Allen key. Um, and otherwise it takes care of itself, itself with normal routine servicing. Um, so we'll take the car for a run. Well, this is what it's all about with any classic car. A nice road and sunny weather. Uh, that's, uh, that's two of the many ingredients needed to have a classic car that actually works and is able to get you from A to B and hopefully back to A again. But um, here we are and I've uh, got the sunroof open, wind in the hair, and this is uh, the ride in particular I notice is not as harsh as other 911s. Uh, it's still firm to be sure, but um, it's not uh, teeth jarringly uh, bumpy even on these uh, incredibly unkempt British roads that we have at the moment. But uh, it's, yeah, it's, it drives like a, a very young 911, this car. Uh, there is not really anything wrong with it at all. It's all uh, no noisy wheel bearings, no electrical faults, uh, nothing wrong with the engine or the gearbox. Uh, steering pulls dead straight. We know this is a non-standard wheel, but um, the car just feels hewn from the solid. It really does. There's nothing um, detrimental about this car at all. Uh, I'm just warming it up. Uh, engine, uh, the tappets um, have been adjusted correctly. Uh, down to 0.1 millimeters is the valve clearance on the uh, the tappets. The inlets are on the top of the engine, with it being flat, horizontal, um, and the exhausts are underneath. And if you have a smell in the cabin on your 911, a smell of oil, it's more than likely the exhaust cam cover gaskets uh, which go on it. Uh, they start to leak and they're, they're held on with a series of nylock nuts and the oil can actually leak past the, the nylock nuts too. 
Uh, and this is something that if you do have a whiff of oil, that's more than likely what it is because the heat exchangers, the actual ducts that the cabin heating air comes through to take the, because it's air cooled of course, you've got no coolant, no water to transfer the heat or liquid. Um, the exhaust rocker covers are right above the heat exchangers and the oil gets on those and heats up and fries and makes all sorts of unpleasant uh, smells and uh, that's the reason. So if you've got a, an oily, smelly 911, chances are the exhaust cam rocker covers need new gaskets and nuts. And of course, one can get very hierarchical about these things and say, well, you know, I don't think this is going to be that nice to drive. Um, it's, the, it's the bottom of the 911 range. It's a 911 and no more. Uh, you know, you, uh, it's got to be a, a blood and thunder um, 992 or 993 or Carrera RS from this period but actually there's something uh, very pleasant about driving this car and I could actually see myself doing distances in this car um, quite easily actually it's just uh, what it was built for you've got some luggage space behind the seats a bit in the front as well um, and yeah, this has got the optional five-speed gearbox. Hard to believe, but um, a five-speed gearbox was actually a factory option on this uh, this year of 911. Uh, this was in the time when German car manufacturers, I'm not sure they've changed that much, um, love to charge for optional extras. I'm sure they make more money on the options than they do on the, uh, on the purchase price of the car. Um, I'm amazed it's got a steering wheel as standards, judging by how they were at the time. But, um, yeah. And now that it is up to temperature, uh, we don't have to, of course, but I'm going to uh, just do a little bit of dancing with heeling and towing, double D clutching, slow in, fast out. Lovely. Beautiful. Absolutely lovely. Just feels so unburstable. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Yes, it's not searingly fast. It's quick and it feels fast with that lovely uh, air-cooled flat six song going on behind you, but just a very nice place to be. Quite a groovy car in its own way. It's not all about values. It's not all about this or that and snobbery. Um, I've driven many different Porsches of very different price points and um, it's not always about the, uh, the final 2%. This is what I would describe as a 98% 911. It's got almost everything. Just do the little bit of cornering dance again. The original 911 Turbo, which came out in 75, if my memory serves me correctly, the uh, three litre, was almost immediately called the Widowmaker because of its extreme on-off handling. Uh, if you backed off mid-corner with those huge back tyres, um, you, uh, you, you could quite easily uh, find yourself travelling backwards just as much as forwards. So, um, this of course is dialed down in this car because it's not as extreme so I would I would venture to say although it can still be tail happy it isn't as tail happy it's um, it's uh, you don't have to be a racing driver to actually enjoy this car to the full and that's worth 98% of anybody's money
Well, that concludes another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop video. Hope you enjoyed it and we'll be back with something else very soon.